It's a pleasure to have Bhargav Narayanan uh, for our talk. He is at Rutgers University and had lots of great results recently, and we'll talk about some of them, uh, namely about finding homeomorphs. Okay, fantastic. Uh, many thanks for the invitation, Andre. It's, uh, it's, very, it's a great pleasure to be giving this talk. Uh, I'll talk about, as I claimed here, about finding homeomorphs. Um, and so the general theme will be sort of topological problems that will attack using combinatorial methods. So in particular, I'll talk about two uh, results, one somewhat recent and one slightly less recent that address uh, the sort of uh, Turan and Dirac type problems uh, in the setting of finding uh, these topological objects. Okay, but without further ado, let's get started. Oh, I should say uh, the talk will be quite gentle. I'll, I'll, I'll go to a sort of nice, easy pace. So, of course, feel free to interrupt me if anything's unclear or if you've got any questions. All right. So I'll start by sort of philosophizing for a little bit, um, which will hopefully motivate the things that I'll eventually end up talking about. So I'll start with sort of what the basic theme of extremal combinatorics uh, is about. Namely, you have some, excuse me, uh, some fixed uh, or some particular combinatorial structure H. It could be a graph, could be a hypergraph. Uh, and you're looking to find H inside um, a much bigger combinatorial structure. Uh, so typically, we'll call that guy G. Uh, so for example, Turan's problem can be phrased in this language. Uh, here, H is just a, a fixed graph or hypergraph and G happens to be a big N vertex graph or hypergraph, and you're looking for a fixed isomorphic copy, uh, not a fixed, sorry, an isomorphic copy of H in G, right? Uh, but of course, H need not be fixed. H could itself be a, a big structure. So for example, Dirac's problem asks you when you can find a Hamiltonian cycle inside a, a big N vertex graph. So H could, in this case, be an n vertex cycle. So H is big. Okay. Uh, so today uh, we'll try and do uh, or think about problems of this nature, except now, instead of being combinatorial structures, H and G will both be somewhat geometric or topological structures. But the theme will nonetheless be the same. Someone gives you uh, a geometric structure H, and you'd like to find it inside a bigger geometrical structure G. Uh, and the role that, uh, that isomorphic copies played when I was talking about uh, the combinatorial versions of these problems, uh, that role will be played in this setting by homeomorphic copies. So geometric equivalence is the, is the notions they'll, they'll be working with. But uh, don't worry about any of those words, we'll make them precise as we go along. Okay, so where do we start sort of bridging these problems that are, are combinatorial on one hand and sort of geometric on the other? And as I'm sure many of you would have guessed, we'll uh, do that by adopting the perspective of uh, simplicial complexes, okay? So simplicial complex is an incredibly simple uh, object combinatorially. It's just a downclosed family of sets. So you have a vertex set V uh, and a simplicial complex on this vertex set. is just a collection of subsets of V that happens to be closed undertaking uh, uh, subsets. So for example, if my vertex set were one, two, three, then what I've written down here is a valid simplicial complex. So I've taken all subsets of size at most two, and that's clearly down closed, right? It's a silly example, but nevertheless, uh, a starting point. So before I get to talking about, you know, these connections, since not everyone might be familiar with this language, I'll start with, you know, the absolute basics. So the, the individual sets inside the simplicial complex we'll call simplices. So each element of our simplicial complex, which is just a subset of vertices, is a simplex. And the dimension of a, of a simplex is just its size minus one. 
So the dimension of a three element set is two and so on and so forth. And of course, the dimension of a complex is just the dimension of, the, of a maximal dimensional simplex inside it. Uh, so I'll call simplices inside a simplicial complex either simplexes or faces or edges. These will all mean the same thing um, in this talk. And if anything's ever unclear, as I said, please uh, stop and ask. OK. So what's the nice thing about simplicial complexes? Uh, as I said, they're incredibly easy to think about as combinatorial objects. They're just uh, downsets. But they're also interesting examples of topological spaces, right? And that's because we can just embed our points in a suitable Euclidean space and think about what we get by uh, taking all the, all the geometric simplices that uh, come from our down-close family. So just to give some silly examples, if we go back to the simple thing I wrote down, uh, namely all the subsets of one, two, three of, of cardinality at most two, everything has cardinality at most two, so that's a one-dimensional complex. And if you draw it out, it looks like the points one, two, three, and the segments one, two, two, three, and one, three. So that's our a geometric realization of this complex. And that's just the, the one dimensional sphere, i.e. the circle in this case. So this twiddly equal to sign will mean geometric equivalence. So that just means that these two uh, drawings, these two objects are homeomorphic as topological spaces. So formally, what does it mean to be homeomorphic? As you all know, uh, one can write down the definition is just that there's a nice uh, continuous bijection between the two spaces um, whose inverse is also continuous. But of course, we don't really need to think about it that way. Namely, all we have to think about um, when it comes to homeomorphism is that they look the same when you sort of think of them as geometric spaces. Because we won't be dealing with any sort of pathology associated with homeomorphisms. So, so the intuitive picture that you have in your head is in fact the correct. Okay, slightly <clears throat> less trivial as an example uh, is to go one dimension up. Let's look at the following two dimensional complex, namely take all the three element subsets of one, two, three, four. So what's the geometric realization of that guy? It's clearly just a tetrahedron, right? You have four points and you draw in all the triangles and you fill them in uh, corresponding to those four points. And of course, the segments are also in your complex and the points are in your complex. Okay, so that's uh, the, the geometric realization of this silly little complex. And uh, what is this complex geometrically? Well, as I've written down here, geometrically, it's nothing but uh, the two dimensional sphere. It just looks like uh, the, the sphere uh, the two-dimensional sphere embedded in three dimensions. Okay, good. So hopefully we all are on board these sort of simple definitions, these simple definitions. So let's, let's carry on. So as I said um, earlier, um, we'll be looking to find uh, these objects in bigger objects up to geometric equivalents. And I should sort of emphasize that combinatorial uh, equivalents, which is just isomorphism, and geometric equivalents are, are slightly different. So up here on the, on the sort of first line of this picture, I've drawn two different simplicial complexes, which are different purely uh, in their sort of combinatorial sort of um, uh, interpretation. They are different sort of, uh, they're not isomorphic combinatorially. You can't relabel the points in one to make it look like the other, which is what isomorphism is, but they're both homeomorphic to the same uh, geometric space. Namely, it looks like a, a disc with a, with a segment sort of glued on. Uh, and so they are in fact equivalent uh, geometrically. So I'll think of these two complexes as being homeomorphic, or in other words, the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So again, we're emphasizing that when you're doing extremal combinatorics, you would definitely distinguish between 
these two different uh, combinatorial realizations, but since we'll be sort of following a geometric theme, we won't. So that'll be the main point of departure between what's sort of classically studied and, and what we'll be what I'll be talking about today. Okay. So why bother with these complexes? Well, of course, you would have noticed this already. Complexes are just hypergraphs by another name, right? So as you all know, an R uniform hypergraph is just a collection of R element subsets of a, of a ground vertex set. But in the language that I've just introduced, that's the same thing as a R minus one dimensional simplicial complex. And all we're doing there is taking the edges of the hypergraph and um, identifying them with the full dimensional simplices of the associated complex. So if you think of a graph, the edges are two element sets, and you're defining a simplicial complex by saying the, the vertex set of that complex are the vertices, and the edges of the graph give you all the one dimensional simplices in the complex. And suddenly three graphs or three uniform hypergraphs obviously give rise to two dimensional complexes and so on and so forth. Okay, so everything I've said so far is just uh, rephrasing of, of object, you know, that we're all familiar with. So you'd ask, why would we bother with, with you know, doing all this? Uh, you could work with either language, but, you know, it's no real reason to think that one's better or worse than the other. Uh, and the reason this is a, a useful perspective to sort of have in mind is that this geometric perspective has been incredibly useful in, uh, in resolving loads of interesting combinatorial problems. Uh, so lots of interesting tools from topology have been brought to bear on problems that at first glance are purely combinatorial. There's, there's no sort of mention of topology in them. Maybe the most famous example was Lati Loas's resolution of the of the Knesa conjecture that uh, is a really beautiful application of, uh, of fixed point theory. Uh, and then um, a less well-known sort of result, at least in the combinatorics community, but much better known in the, in the theoretical computer science community, is, um, is the Kahn Stacks uh, Sturtevant result on evasiveness. Uh, and I'll tell you maybe briefly what that is. Uh, it's, it's really beautiful stuff. Uh, so imagine two players playing a game. Uh, so they both agree on, let's say, a graph property in advance. So for example, the property could be the property of all connected graphs. Okay. And so let's say one of the players, Alice, thinks of a graph. And Bob, the other player, asks Alice questions about this graph to try and decide if the graph that Alice is thinking about is in this property, namely the property of all connected graphs. Okay. Uh, and Bob can ask questions of the form, is this edge in my graph or is it not in the graph? Uh, and of course, uh, Bob's goal is to, is to work out as quickly as possible if Alice's uh, graph is in this example connected. So we call a property in this case, connectivity evasive if Bob has to literally query every edge to work out the answer. So if Alice can delay Bob all the way until he's revealed every edge. And there's a beautiful conjecture that says every monotone property, uh, i.e. any increasing property that's invariant under isomorphism must be evasive. Uh, and this uh, result that I've just mentioned here proves it uh, when the universe has a prime order. And it's, again, uh, a beautiful application of uh, fixed point theorems. So the, the way you prove it is by topological arguments. Okay. So if you're not familiar with it, I'd, I'd uh, highly encourage you to look it up. It's, it's gorgeous. Uh, and then there are other applications as well. Uh, famously, uh, results on analogs of Hall's theorem in hypergraphs, namely, when can you find perfect matchings in, in hypergraphs were, were worked out um, by Aroni and Haxel, and these also relied on using interesting topological notions of connectivity. So 
you know, loads of interesting tools that topologists have that we can bring to bear and problems that we might care about. For some of them that I've just mentioned here, like borsuk ulam or, or other fixed point theorems, one could use various topological notions of connectivity, homology groups sort of tell you interesting things. So there's loads that can be brought to bear on, on problems that seem to have nothing to do with topology. Okay, so this is all sort of um, stuff that's been done. But today we're going to go the other way. So combinatorics has a lot of interesting tools as well. And the plan for today will be to use probabilistic and extremal tools to try and understand sort of geometric topological problems uh, of, uh, about simplicial complexes. So that'll be the plan for today's talk. And so for example, we'll bring many of the well-known sort of tools in this area, such as dependent random uh, choice or, or the regularity method or, or this absorption technique. Uh, we'll bring these sorts of methods to bear on, on these problems. Okay, so let me just remind you about the sort of general theme of what we're trying to do. We have some geometric structure H that we're trying to find inside a bigger geometric structure. So for the rest of the talk, find will mean a homeomorphic copy of H. So I just want to find uh, a copy of H inside G that looks like H geometrically. I don't care about isomorphism. I don't care about combinatorial equivalence. I only care about geometric equivalence. So find um, going forwards will just mean up to homeomorphism. And the sort of geometric objects that we'll be working with going forwards will be simplicial complexes. So this will be our model for uh, sort of topological spaces. I should say that this is not um, anything that sort of valid as a sort of general geometric framework in its full generality for reasons that I don't really want to get into here. But it turns out there exist uh, spaces in you know, dimensions as just as small as four that can't be represented by triangulation. So, so you can't capture sort of all interesting, uh, you know, well-behaved topological spaces using simplicial complexes, but you can capture quite a few of them using them. And you can certainly capture all of them in dimensions smaller than four using them. So this will be a good place to start. Uh, okay, so if everyone's happy with the language so far, we can get started with some uh, actual maths. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Dirac's problem. Namely, when can you find a Hamilton cycle in an n-vertex bra? And this has a, a, a very sort of satisfactory answer. Namely, that as soon as the minimum degree of the graph, which I've denoted by little delta of g here, is at least n over 2. So as soon as every vertex in your graph sees at least n over two edges uh, incident to it, then you'll start seeing a Hamilton cycle. Uh, so if I just reformulate this in the language that we've just established, the theorem says that we can find a Hamilton cycle, but what's a Hamilton cycle as a simplicial complex? Well, my handy helpful figure here shows you this Hamilton cycle. And that is just the one dimensional sphere as mentioned earlier, that's just S1. So Dirac's theorem is telling us that we can find under suitable degree conditions, a spanning copy of the one dimensional sphere in our, in our graph or equivalently in our one complex. Okay, uh, what happens for three graphs? So let's move up one dimension so let's now ask the same question for three graphs or equivalently for two dimensional simplicial complexes. So I'll start by maybe mentioning a lot of what was already known, uh, not along these geometric lines, but in terms of purely combinatorial generalizations of Dirac's theorem. So from, I, I've left out a fair few names, but thanks to the work of uh, Rodel, Ruchinsky, and Semeredi, and uh, also of Kun, Mycroft, and Ostas, we know exact or nearly exact analogues of Dirac's theorem 
uh, for let's say three uniform hypergraphs, three graphs, when we replace Hamilton cycles with objects of the form I've drawn on the right here. So these would be the analogs of Hamilton cycles uh, that these people consider. So they look like triangulation, sorry, not triangulations. They look like a bunch of uh, uh, triangles that come from some cyclic ordering of the wet. So if you have these notions of Hamilton cycles, then we more or less know the correct degree conditions that would guarantee a copy of these things. Okay, but what about if, what happens if we adopt uh, the geometric perspective that I've been harping on about? Uh, and indeed, this was something that, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, Tim Gowers suggested in, in maybe 2005. Uh, I'm sure other people might have independently raised this question. Uh, that's one person I know for a fact who raised it. One could ask the same question in the geometric language, namely, remember that Dirac promised us a spanning copy of the one sphere in a, in a one complex. And so one could ask the same thing for two complexes, namely, under what degree conditions would you be able to see a spanning geometric copy of the two sphere inside uh, your two complex? Okay. And so this was one of the results that I was hoping to say a couple of words about. So with uh, Agilos Georgiakopoulos, John Hasselgrave, Richard Montgomery, uh, we proved a few years back, I think a couple of years back, uh, that the answer or the analog is that you need a degree of roughly n over three. So if you've got a two complex on n vertices where the minimum degree is roughly n over three plus a little bit, then your two complex will have a spanning copy of the two sphere. So let me clarify what I mean by degree, because unlike with graphs where there's a unique notion of degree, there could be multiple notions uh, for three graphs or equivalently two complexes. Uh, so by the minimum degree, we mean the minimum degree of a two set. So for every two vertices in our, in our two complex, we ask how many faces does that uh, two set live inside? And the smallest of these numbers is what I mean by the minimum degree. Uh, this bound is tight, as I'll show you, in that you can't uh, write down a better constant in place of one third. The error term is probably unnecessary, but that's what we managed to do. And I'll also say that in this theorem, and this is a theme that we'll see later on, there's nothing special about S2, about the two-sphere. The same theorem works if instead of the two-sphere, you give me an arbitrary two-complex uh, and you ask me to find the spanning homeomorph of that complex. So in other words, what I wrote down here is merely uh, a special case of the, the slightly more general result that says you can do it for uh, the, the tetrahedron, which in other words is the sphere. So in place of the tetrahedron or in place of the two sphere, you could write down any fixed three graph or fixed two complex and the same degree conditions would allow you to find a spanning uh, geometric copy of that object. Okay, uh, good. So at this point, I wanted to actually maybe show you some calculations to uh, tell you what's going on. So in, since I can't write to my computer, let me share a different screen. So here's a construction. So take three vertex sets or three sets of vertices, each of size n over three. And take all the edges that look like two and one here, two and one here, and two and one here. Okay. So what's the, um, what's the minimum degree of this construction? So for example, every two element set that looks like bang, bang, so let's call these guys A, B, and C, then any two set that goes from A to B certainly lives inside N over three edges. And the same can be said about any two set that goes across two of them 
Uh, and similarly, for any two set that lives inside a single class. So clearly, the minimum degree of this construction is something like n over 3. Uh, maybe plus minus 1 or 2. I'm being cavalier here, but that's OK. Uh, and I claim that you cannot find any spanning homeomorphic copies of the two sphere in this construction. And so why is this true? It's true for the following reason. If you think about the following equivalence relation, so let's say that two edges are connected. So let's say two of the three sets in my uh, hypergraph are connected if they share a two set. Okay, so let's say Okay, uh, and that defines the notion of connectivity. So let's look at uh, the components uh, or the equivalence classes under this notion of connectivity. So So these equivalence classes usually have a name, they're called tight components. And let's go back to our construction and ask what the tight components are. So how do the edges get partitioned under this notion of connectivity? Well, it's clear that all these edges lie in their own component because they don't meet any of the other two types of edges in two vertices. They meet them all in a single vertex. Uh, and similarly for the edges between BC and the edges between AC. So in our construction, the edges split into three tight components. Right? Between A and B, B and C and C and A. And I claim that for this simple reason, you couldn't hope to find a spanning copy of the sphere. Because what does the sphere look like? A spanning copy of the sphere looks like a bunch of points placed on the sphere and then triangulated, right? That, that would be a spanning copy of the sphere. It would look like all the wet seas placed on, on the surface of the sphere and, and that surface triangulated using those points, where all the triangles would have to be edges. Sorry, that's a, a really terrible picture. Let me try again. Okay, so you'd, you'd be doing that on the surface of the sphere to get your spanning copy of the sphere. Uh, but think about the edges uh, appearing in the spanning copy. Well, they'd all be connected because the sphere has no boundary. They'd all be connected under this relation twiddles. And so in particular, those edges would all have to come from the same tight component in this hypothetical uh, homeomorph of the, the sphere. But we know that all the tight components lie between two classes. None of these tight components actually span the entire vertex set. So, so this has no chance of happening. So there's no spanning close surface of any sort in this in this two complex. So no spanning closed surfaces. Let's learn the sphere. Okay. Is that is that clear to everyone why uh, that doesn't work? Okay. Uh, okay, so that was the lower bound construction. Uh, and I claim 
so that shows us the silly construction that I just uh, talked to you about. Shows you that in our theorem right here, n over three is in fact the best possible bound that you could hope to write down. Uh, and unsurprisingly, it, it, you know, like with a lot of these Dirac type problems, the lower bounds are not hard once you've found the right construction. Uh, so the construction here that I just sort of worked out for you uh, just now shows us that this bound of n over three is, is tight. Uh, that one can't hope to write down a, a smaller linear function of n there. Uh, what about the upper bound? Well, I claim that I shan't, I won't be able to show you how one gets to n over three, but we'll at least get started. I'll, I'll just to get, give you a flavor for the problem, let me show you how you might get an upper bound of three n over four. So I claim that if every two set is in at least three n over four edges, you'll happily find a spanning copy of the sphere. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, sorry, I need to start the sharing again. Give me a second. Okay, so why is this true? Well, suppose that our three graph is minimum degree three n over four. So our goal is to find spinning copy of the two sphere. Okay. So I'll in fact find a very specific spanning copy of the two sphere, namely one that looks like this. Uh, what this picture is saying will become clear in a second. What I mean is, I'll take a, I'll find a big cycle and I'll put triangles on top of it and triangles on below it. So in other words, I'll build a cone on both sides using two vertices, and that's clearly a sphere, right? It looks like two cones glued together like that, and that's a copy of the sphere. And I claim we can do this uh, when the minimum degree is at least three n over four. And this is easy. Why? We just use Dirac's theorem for graphs. Take any two vertices x and y, and think about all the two sets which do that, right? So fix X and Y and build a graph, let's say G dashed on all the other points where you join a pair of points if you have both ABX and ABY as edges in our original three graph. Right? Now, if we started with a three graph of of min degree three n over four, that means that any given two set so if I look at any given two set, it has a degree three n over four. So let's just look at a vertex A in here. I claim that all the vertices their degree inside this new graph g dashed is at least n over two. And that's straightforward. Namely, look at x a and y a. These two two sets have large degree. So in particular, there must be loads of b's such that both x a b and y a b are edges and three n over four was chosen exactly 
to ensure that each A inside G dash will have degree at least n over two. But now we're done because by Dirac theorem, Dirac theorem, sorry, we find the Hamilton cycle inside G dash. But what does that mean back in G world? It means that you have the following structure, i.e. All the, all the triangles in this picture are edges of our three graph. And that's just what I mentioned earlier. You managed to glue these two cones together to get a sphere and you've hit every vertex. So in other words, you found a spanning copy of the sphere. Of course, under a much uh, weaker assumption, namely that the min degree of your three graph was three n over four to start with. Okay, uh, so that was the easy argument for three n over four. I won't say very much about the proof of the n over three bound, except I'll mention some problems that arise along the way. So it's not too hard to get three n over four down to two n over three in that uh, argument, because up to two n over three, you'll find plenty of tetrahedra in your in your three graph, uh, and when one thinks about this problem, it's not too hard uh, to see that when you can actually find loads of tetrahedra, you can use them to glue various things together in order to try and uh, stitch a nice sort of spherical surface together. Uh, and I believe um, this was something that Peter Kivash, uh, David Conlon and David Ellis had also managed to do a while back, but they didn't uh, bother writing it down. Um, one can then get down to n over two with the uh, very sort of fiddly sort of improvements on this idea using bigger analogs of tetrahedra. But one runs into a new problem over there, namely around this notion that I just mentioned earlier, that of tight components. Uh, of course, as I said, if you find a spanning sort of spanning a uh, surface of any sort inside your three graph, the edges that you use must all come from a single type component because that surface has no boundary. Uh, up until your degree gets below n over two, it turns out that all the edges in your three graph will be in a single type component. Uh, so in other words, your three graph will be connected uh, in this type component uh, notion. But below NO2, you might have multiple type components. Uh, and there, many of the edges could be completely unuseful uh, or unusable because they don't lie in a spanning type component. So one needs some other ideas to, to get around that obstacle. Uh, needs to use, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, one needs sort of many of the now sort of standardish tools in in the area, such as the regularity method and absorption to, to do these things. Okay, I'll say, uh, I'll say no more about this problem. In what time I have left, I'll talk about, uh, so I, this was about the Dirac problem for complexes. Let me now say something about the Turan problem for complexes. Sorry, Bargas, can I ask you a question before you move on? So even, it's, even though it goes against uh, you not saying anything more about this, uh, can you maybe give an idea on uh, what kind of structure do you eventually find? Is it like a fixed structure, fixed no. Uh, triangulation? No, by no means. So uh, it it will uh, it, it'll depend on on what you see as you do the proof in some sense. So uh, roughly speaking we will leverage this cheap argument that we had for 3n over 4. It's easy to find, maybe let me doodle a little more. Okay, so here's a simple observation. Let's assume that the minimum degree is merely epsilon n, so it's not much. So there's no reason to expect uh, a spanning sphere, uh, as we know that we could only hope for that at around n over three. 
But here's something you can start to find even at this sort of uh, density of edges. Namely, you can start finding big double pyramids of the sort that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so these guys might not necessarily span anymore. So you couldn't apply Dirac's theorem in here, but you could find long cycles. And so you could build these big double pyramids, right? Uh, so the strategy will roughly be to build a lot of these guys initially. And these one gets quite cheaply. And now our challenge will become to sort of glue these guys together. So what have you done? You've sort of found loads of little disjoint spheres uh, or loads of big disjoint spheres inside your three bar. We have to now translate this into a single sphere, but one can sort of try and build tubes between them in order to connect these spheres up into a, into a, into a smaller number of spheres. Uh, and so in order to do this, for example, this gluing procedure is quite easy when the minimum degree is, is about 2n over 3. And one can glue them using tetrahedra. Uh, so for example, if uh, this might not be super helpful, but for example, if at some point I had some fiddly bit of the boundary that was sticking out like this, and I needed to patch up a hole here, it would be great if I could find a vertex that happened to have edges meeting all these two sets. So if you had some exposed boundary of length three here, you could decrease it to length two. So these sorts of simple ideas will work uh, up to 2n over three uh, and with some tweaking even down to n over two. Uh, but you need slight, somewhat more complicated sort of robust notions of knitting things together to get down to n over three. Uh, does that give you some idea, Andre? Yeah, yeah, that's good. So it really resembles uh, this absorption type proofs of how oh, yeah. you find the uh, oh, no, Hamiltonian cycle, in the sense, exactly. except you need more geometry, I guess. Exactly, you need more geometry. And at some point, we also have to deal with these tight components, and there one needs uh, some sort of, um, we need some, we have some reliance on regularity, but happily, uh, we only rely on graph regularity. So for dealing with three graphs, one doesn't, thankfully need to uh, use three graph regularity. So that's... Okay, great. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Uh, okay. So carrying on, with that having been said about the Dirac problem, uh, let's turn now to the Turan problem. Uh, now I'll, I'll talk about a question of Nutty lineals. Uh, I'll say, I'll try and say a little bit about it. Um, but again, I'll have to be brief because uh, the proofs are, you know, the proofs here are not as involved as the proofs earlier, but nevertheless, uh, I won't really have time to say much about them. So again, I'll cheat like I did earlier that I'll prove easier things that I can prove quickly. Okay, uh, with that caveat out of the way, uh, what is the Turan problem? As you guys all know, The Turan problem says, I give you some fixed R graph, some hypergraph or just graph H, and you'd like to know how many edges you need in a big N vertex uh, hypergraph graph that will force uh, an isomorphic copy of H. So we're again, looking for a combinatorial copy in my language. And this is a, a well-established theory, loads and loads of things are known. Uh, especially in graph world, but also loads and loads of things are not known in hypergraph world. So it's not that, you know, things are completely understood here and there's nothing to be done. There's loads still left to be done. But in comparison to the topological problem, much, much more is known in combinatorial world. Okay. And so I'll talk a little bit to finish up about the Turan problem for complexes. 
uh, which is exactly the question here, except the notion of copy becomes different. We're now looking for homeomorphic copies. And so the question then becomes, instead of an R graph, I give you an R complex. Or strictly speaking, an R minus one dimensional complex. If you want to maintain the equivalence between hypergraphs and complexes, uh, and you ask how many facets, so how many four dimensional faces do you need in a bigger complex to force a geometric copy of H or a homeomorphic copy of H? So let's start with a simple setting, namely of one complexes or equivalently of graphs. So suppose my graph that I'm looking to find a geometric copy of is the triangle. So that's clearly just the circle up to homeomorphism, which, excuse me, uh, is homeomorphic to any cycle. So in other words, trying to find a geometric copy of the triangle is the same as finding a cycle in our graph, and that has an easy answer. You need linearly many edges make a graph acyclic, linear in the number of vertices. And so in order to find a geometric copy of the triangle, you need you know, n plus n edges in an n vertex graph. And the same sort of phenomenon holds for any fixed graph H. It's a well-known old sort of result of Marja that says for any fixed H, some large linear number of edges will be enough to find a subdivision of H. So subdivision of H just means you're allowed to introduce vertices inside these edges of H. So you can find a subdivision of H, and that's clearly, certainly, a homeomorphic copy of H. And these results are tight up to the constants. So the, the geometric sort of Turan problem for one complexes is more or less completely understood. OK, you could ask for more precise results as to what this constant is, and various things are known about that as well. But this is not what I'll be focusing on. Instead, I'll ask the same problem about two complexes. So let's start again with a silly example. So suppose that H is the complete three graph on four vertices. Or in other words, the tetrahedron. Well, that's nothing but the sphere up to homeomorphism, the two sphere, and a very classical result of Brown, Erdős, and Sosh works out the answer in this specific case. It turns out that the number of edges you need to force a copy of the two sphere in a three graph or a two complex is about n to the five over two. Uh, this is tight up to multiplicative constants. So a three graph needs to have about n to the five over two edges in order for it to contain a homeomorphic copy of the sphere. Or, you know, in other words, some, some triangulation of the sphere. Uh, but of course, there's nothing special about the sphere. It's a natural starting point, but we could ask that uh, in slightly greater generality, much like Marda proves what I just said in words for the triangle for any fixed H. And linear asks this uh, very natural question uh, for general complexes. So as I said, Brown, Erdős, and Sosh tells you what the answer is for uh, the tetrahedron. So suppose I give you, in place of the tetrahedron, some general two-dimensional complex H. Is there an analog of Marder's theorem? In other words, is there a universal bound that you can write down, which might, you know, differ in constants depending on the fixed complex H that you give me, but would nonetheless work for every fixed complex H. Uh, if the question that I'm raising is not clear, the answer should hopefully clarify it. So more recently, with Peter Kiwash, Jason Long, and uh, Alex Scott, I proved that there is such an analog of Marder's theorem. In other words, for every fixed two complex H, or in other words, for every fixed three graph H, if you have roughly n to the three minus one fifth uh, edges in a big n vertex three graph or n vertex two complex, then you'll be able to find a homeomorphic copy of H inside uh, your big n vertex uh, complex. 
uh, of course, this is much more general than Brown Erdős and Sosh in that you don't have to feed in the sphere. The, the claim holds for any fixed two complex that you give me, but this generality comes at a price. Recall that Brown Erdős and Sosh showed that you need an exponent of five half for spheres, whereas the general exponent that we wrote down was three minus one over five. And, and this is the price that we pay for the generality at which we can prove what we prove. But we expect that the reason we get this exponent is merely an artifact of our methods. We don't believe three minus one fifth to be tight. And we make the following conjecture, namely that in place of three minus one over five here, you can write down five halves, so three minus one over two for any complex H. So in other words, the exponent for spheres should work for any complex up to multiplicative constant. Okay. Uh, so in order to show you something non-trivial about what's going on here, let me uh, maybe sh prove something that is easy Uh, so I claim, so this will also illustrate what makes the theorem non-trivial. So I claim that for each fixed age, so for each fixed three graph, There is some exponent, there is some epsilon h greater than zero such that n to the three minus epsilon h edges will force a homeomorphic copy of h inside your big three graph. So, of course, this is something much weaker than the theorem. Our theorem, of course, says that you can take epsilon h to be one fifth for all h. But this is not what I'm going to show you a quick argument for. Uh, but let's show the slightly easier thing. So here's my three graph h. I'm going to literally draw a single edge of h because I'm going to do, I'm going to perform a transformation on h. So here's h. So I'll first introduce a new vertex inside every edge of H. So let me start using some colors. So I'll introduce a vertex inside every uh, edge or two dimensional face of H. And then I'll introduce new vertices also inside every one dimensional face of H. So in other words, inside every two set uh, H. And why am I doing this? I'm doing this in order to do this. And I'll replace the, the edges of H. So I've drawn a single edge here with the one, two, three, four, five, six. All right. With the six edges in this picture. So I start with some three graph H and I produce a new three graph H tilde. So it's something like subdividing for graphs, but slightly a tiny bit more, uh, uh, more involved. So why am I doing this? Hopefully it's clear from my use of colors. So firstly, if you think about what has happened geometrically, it's easy to see that H and H tilde are the same geometrically because I can group the edges of H tilde into these sorts of blobs and I just recover a geometric copy of H. And the reason we use the colors there is because H tilde is three part -out. So in other words, every edge of H tilde 
looks like a red, a blue, and a green. Ah, oh, and now we knew from classical results in about you know three graph Turan that some exponent less than three will force a copy of H tilde because it's three parter. So that's easy. So in other words, we're finding a very fixed homeomorph of H at the price uh, of using an exponent that depends on H. So the theorem that I mentioned, of course, uh, gives you a single exponent that works for every H. And unsurprisingly, the one needs uh, slightly different arguments to deal with this. But primarily, that the main sort of driving force in that argument is, is sort of based on dependent random choice. Uh, but the argument that we have still finds somewhat unsatisfactorily a bounded size homeomorph of H. So it'll find some homeomorph of H that has maybe a million times as many edges and wetsies as H does. And so that has no hope of giving us the correct answer of five halves. One needs to be able to find unbounded size homeomorphs in order to get down to the correct bound of five halves. And currently, we have no idea how to do that. OK. I think I might have said everything I was hoping to say. So I'll maybe stop here and just mention some open problems. So of course, in this talk, I was talking about the two-dimensional uh, sort of geometric problems about simplicial complexes that you might want to care about. But the same questions that I mentioned make sense in, in high dimensions. So can we prove similar results for, for four graphs or equivalently for, <coughs> equivalently for three-dimensional complexes and so on and so forth? So we can prove certain things, but the things that we can prove, to the best of my knowledge, are not nearly as impressive as what we can do in, uh, in two dimensions, so nothing's been written down. And so there are loads of natural questions that one might want to think about, both in three, uh, both in two and in greater dimension. Uh, Matty Lineal sort of uh, loves these problems and he advertises them a lot. And it's from him that I learned about many of these questions. Uh, so I'm doing my part to sort of hopefully tell you guys that you should go and think about high dimensions in these, uh, in these geometric ways. Uh, and I'll also maybe emphasize what I was saying about the, the Turan version of our result, namely that we get this exponent of 3 minus 1 over 5. But that's not right. We expect it to be 5 halves. And even for very specific uh, geometric objects that you might want to find, we don't know this. So I'll close by reiterating a, a question of Nati Lineals that uh, I really like and, uh, and that's still open, namely, replace the sphere with the torus. So you're now looking for a homeomorph of the torus in a three uniform hypergraph. The conjecture is that you can do it at five halves. Of course, it's a special case of this general conjecture that five halves is the right exponent for any fixed homeomorph. But even in the case of the torus, that's open and we have no idea how to prove it. And that would be a, be a, a lovely place to start uh, with regard to proving the full sort of conjecture. All right, I'll stop here. Great, thank you very much, Bargov. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand your example with three partite hypergraph. Graph. Uh, previous slide. Uh, why does? Sure. Okay. So, so here's what I'm doing. Uh, we have. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Eleven inches. Yes. Uh, uh, oh no! Sorry. Uh, only the small triangles in this picture. The the sort of the smallest triangles. Of which there are six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So maybe, maybe you can, uh, oh, can, reiterate, can re reiterate the exp explanation. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean these little triangles and only those. Does that clarify what I mean? So I introduce these new vertices and I replace each edge with these six little triangles that I'm sort of filling in. So the big triangles all disappear. I mean, it's fine for me. It's, okay. Uh, but the person who asked, I hope yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, but, Okay. Um, uh, I have actually a couple of questions also. Please. So, uh, maybe the first one is why uh, five halves is easy for the sphere? Is there an intuitive yes. reason for that? Uh, it's the same argument that we saw earlier. So yeah, so the brown Erdős source result that I mentioned to you is not a terribly hard result. So in fact, I can show you the proof now. And it's the argument that we've been seeing all along for finding spheres, namely, pick a random pair of vertices X and Y, and look at the graph that you induce by joining a pair of points if they're connected to both, if, if ABX and ABY happen to be edges. Mm -hmm. If you pick X and Y at random, it's easy to show by convexity that this graph will have greater than n edges in expectation when you start with n to the 5 over 2 edges. And that's the reason. Oh, okay. okay. Because then you find a cycle somewhere in there and you're done. Mm -hmm. And you build this double pyramid once again. But as you can see, this is very specific to the, to the sphere. So we're lucky that we have such a nice kind of uh, triangulation for the sphere. Yeah. Or... And it happens to be that this is tight. For example, the random construction with deletion will show you that five halves is tight. You'll need some uh, uh, counting result of dots on how many triangulations of the sphere there are, but, but it's not hard. Mm -hmm. and, to... uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah that's, that's cool, thanks. Uh, the other one is why one fifth? Is there an intuitive reason for why one fifth? Ah, uh, no, no. This, it's as I said, an artifact of the proof. The only interesting thing about it is that that one fifth doesn't depend on age. That's the main sort of interesting thing about the result. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just trying to prove three minus epsilon where epsilon was independent of age, and our argument ends up giving one fifth. It has something to do with. Um, with sort of counting four cycles in these linked graphs. Uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't think I can manage a, a very sort of uh, insightful explanation in a few minutes. Okay, okay. Well, I'm thinking about a possible next question. Anyone else has questions? So, uh, hey, Bargov, I would have a question. Hey, hey. By the way, so could you bo go back to the previous picture about this subdivision? Uh, this one here? Yeah. Okay. So, so you can view this as like a, a one subdivision, analog of one subdivision from graphs. And for graphs, we know that the extremal number of one subdivision is onto the three half. So is it not true that already for this, this that you define, you have the universal constant epsilon h? Uh, not for this guy, no. Uh, so you need some degrees to be bounded or something, I believe, for what, from what I know. Uh, so what's the thing about one subdivisions that gives you a universal exponent? It's because you can partition them into two groups so that the degrees on one side are bounded, right? Yeah. Uh, so you won't necessarily have that sort of property here. Uh, so the degrees are bounded only on, in one of the three partition classes. Namely, the red vertices all have fixed degree, or sorry, bounded degree, but that's not the case of the uh, green and blue vertices. They might have degrees depending on, on H, right? So, green, so now in, 
In degree, you mean two degrees? Uh, I just mean one degree of wet seas. Because green has just, oh. No, no, no. So this particular uh, edge, this two set, could be sitting inside loads of different three edges. So the picture's not uh, super helpful. Okay. But the, point is the green could be involved in, in loads of other uh, edges as well. Okay, okay. Thanks. But that is one of the ideas that feeds into the proof. So we'd love to have some subdivision where degrees are bounded in all but one class maybe, but I don't believe we can do that in general. Um, so we've got to do something weirder. So we've got to project it down to graph world and do something based on dependent random choice once again, but in that projected version. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And here you don't know universal constant for um, four dimensional or higher dimension? Oh, didn't really think about it. Uh, so the short answer is no. It might follow from our arguments, but I don't make that claim. I haven't checked. So uh, you, if you want to think about it, you should certainly first see if our methods might help. But it's very possible they don't. Because as I said, part of the argument involves the reduction to graph world. And whenever someone says that, you have to be cautious because the reduction in four dimensions might involve going to three graph world. And we don't understand things about three graphs nearly as well as we do about graphs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Maybe one more question from my side. The, do you have a one degree version of the first theorem? Uh, no. And I don't. What is case. the correct, what even the, is the correct guess for the... Uh, uh, so the short answer is I don't know. Uh, it's something that I didn't really spend much time thinking about. Uh, so if I were to say something now, it would probably be incorrect because I, I haven't thought about it. Okay. Uh, my guess, apropos of nothing, is that these sort of spanning type component issues would still be the obstacle. Uh, but I'm hesitant to sort of uh, say something and then, you know, be proved wrong in two minutes. So, uh, because I literally haven't thought about it. Okay. Uh, I saw a question from the chat. Uh, would there exist limitations? Uh, uh, So yes, yeah, so uh, I think um, the high, the question that I've got asks what happens, let's say, for three manifolds, uh, and don't just take arbitrary, uh, you know, three complexes, but rather triangulations of the three sphere. And the short answer is I don't know. Uh, three spheres are already interesting. Uh, whoever asked that. So for example, the analog of our result. For Dirac's problem, I don't, we did think about it a little bit. I don't think we know it for three spheres or in high dimensions. Uh, we have a good guess for what the blocking constructions ought to be. I think we, I don't know if we conjectured this in the paper, but for three spheres, we believe the, the analogous bound would be n over four um, from a similar type of construction, but, but we don't know how to prove it. Let's thank Bargov. Thanks a lot, Bargov, for, for doing this. Let me applaud. Thank you.